We started this first season of the San Antonio Storybook at Fort Sam Houston. As Major Jamie Dobson drove me around the parade ground, she pointed out where the first military airplane flight took place in 1910. This is where the Army Air Corps really was born. You wanted to say got off the ground, but you stopped it. <laughs> the first flight of what would eventually become the U.S. Air Force took place right here in San Antonio. Just a few years after Orville Wright made the first flight ever over the beaches of North Carolina, Army Lieutenant Benjamin Fuloy took off from San Antonio in a used Wright flyer. He didn't really go anywhere. He just circled over Fort Sam Houston a few times. Lieutenant Fuloy was by no means an experienced pilot when he made that famous first flight. He had learned to fly mostly through written correspondence with the Wright brothers. Now, this approach to flight instruction had obvious limitations. That's why a more experienced pilot, Max Leal, was later brought to San Antonio to teach new pilots how to fly and land safely. To assist in the training, Leal brought with him a young woman by the name of Katherine Stinson. You may not have heard of Katherine Stinson before, but like Davy Crockett, Theodore Roosevelt, and Manu Ginobili, she's part of a long line of fascinating characters who have passed through San Antonio and helped make it the place that it is today. Her story is the one we're going to tell in this chapter of the San Antonio Storybook, a podcast about the people and places that define the Alamo City. I'm Brantley Hightower. Katherine Stinson was born in Fort Payne, Alabama in the last decade of the 19th century. She was a petite woman, barely five feet tall and barely 100 pounds. She had long, curly hair and a big, charismatic smile. Growing up, Katherine dreamed of playing the piano. By her late teens, she had become an accomplished pianist, but a classical musical education was expensive and her family didn't have the means to pay for it. And so, Katherine came up with a plan. She would become an exhibition stunt pilot, a female barnstormer, and in doing so, she would earn enough money to pay for her musical training. When I first learned about Catherine's money-making scheme, it struck me as completely bonkers. It was, especially for her, because as she quickly found out, no one would give a female lessons. That's Tim O'Crongley. He's the aviation planning director at Garver, an engineering and planning services firm here in San Antonio. She was very petite, and at the time, you know, flying was a man's uh, venture, and, you know, it, it was physically demanding, uh, flying those early planes. Catherine had heard rumors that barnstormers could make $1,000 a day. If that was true, she could quickly save up enough money to pay for her musical education. All she needed was an airplane, and someone to teach her how to fly it. She went to a lot of people to try to learn to fly and and was just flatly rejected. She finally found an instructor who initially was against it, but eventually took her on as a student named Max Lill. And uh, did he was a great pilot himself and ended up uh, teaching her how to fly. And he also became kind of uh, the reason why she ended up in San Antonio. As I mentioned earlier, Max Lill was later hired by the United States Army to help train its pilots. He would come down to Fort Sam in San Antonio because of the flying weather year-round, and he did a lot of flight instruction. And so Catherine followed him down here to continue her flying career. Flying careers could be pretty short back then. Max himself was killed in a plane crash just a few years later. Now, part of the problem was that no one had much flying experience at that point, and it didn't help that the planes they were flying were fragile and unreliable. The Wright Flyer, the airplane Catherine first flew, was primitive at best. So it was made out of wood and canvas, and it was open air. It looked much like one of those paragliders today. So it was canvas, a lot of wire, a lot of wood. Uh, It was quite amazing that someone would get in that and strap themselves in it and just take off. But that's exactly what Catherine did. She strapped herself in, and she took off. Catherine proved to be a natural pilot. She became the fourth woman to earn a pilot certificate in the United States. After that, she started doing exactly what she said she was going to do. She began touring the country as a barnstormer. Because of her youthful appearance, she called herself 
The Flying Schoolgirl. But Catherine was much more than just a novelty. Yes, she was a woman pilot, and that was unusual back then, but she did things no other pilots had ever done before. You know, if you look back to the the true flying aspect, the true pioneer records that she set, she couldn't have done that unless she was a very accomplished pilot. The first person to do what they called the loop-de-loop, which was, you know, an aerobatic maneuver. And you think back to those planes, that's quite a feat to do that. She was the first person uh, to fly at night, and then she would put magnesium flares on it, which again, you know, these planes were made out of wooden canvas, and you're putting flares on them. <laughs> In time, it became clear that Catherine's future was as a pilot and not as a pianist. Instead of the money she earned going towards a classical musical education, she used it to lease a flat, open piece of land on the south side of San Antonio. In 1916, she and her family established the Stinson School of Aviation. Catherine's mom was the brains behind the operation, but her sister chipped in as well. Margie, the younger sister, remained here and was actually very instrumental in being a great flight instructor herself. She trained many Canadian pilots that went on to become World War I pilots, and a few of those even became aces. When the U.S. finally entered the First World War, Catherine was one of America's best pilots. If given the opportunity, it seems likely she, too, would have become an ace as well. She certainly wanted to be. She volunteered to serve in the Army Air Corps and was flatly rejected. But, of course, Uncle Sam said, I'm sorry, you're the wrong gender, Miss Stinson. We appreciate your patriotism, but we can't do that. That's Ken Painter. He's a volunteer for the Texas Air Museum here in San Antonio. He told me about how much Catherine wanted to support the war effort. When it became apparent she wasn't going to be able to fly combat missions over Europe, she decided instead to volunteer to become an ambulance driver for the Red Cross. When Uncle Sam found out what her plans were, they asked her if she would consent to going on a flying junket around the United States to raise money for the Red Cross. As Catherine flew from town to town, she would drop leaflets asking people to make donations to the Red Cross. She would then land and collect those donations before flying on to the next town. When she was finished, she flew her airplane to Washington, D.C., landed it on the National Mall, taxied up to the base of the Washington Monument, shut down, got out of her airplane, and handed over a promissory note in the amount of $2 million to the then Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. Done with a flourish, no doubt. Catherine eventually did become an ambulance driver on the Western Front. The weather there was cold and damp, and as the war was ending, she contracted a particularly nasty strain of the flu. In her weekend state, she was susceptible to other infections and would eventually be diagnosed with tuberculosis. Although new forms of treatment are bringing added hope, proper food and rest and plenty of fresh air remain the essentials for the cure of tuberculosis. For a time, however, she will have to go into a sanatorium. In a supreme bit of irony, the illness she contracted on the ground in Europe effectively ended her career in the air. Catherine moved to Santa Fe and would never again fly a plane. Catherine's career as a pilot was relatively short. It lasted less than a decade, but in those few years, she managed to cram in quite a lot. In addition to everything we've already mentioned, Catherine was also one of the first pilots to carry airmail in both the United States and Canada. She was one of the first women to fly alone at night. She was the first woman to fly over London, China, and Japan. She set several long-distance records and came to be quite famous. In her day, Catherine Stinson was a household name. But chances are you had never heard of the name Katherine Stinson before you started listening to this podcast. I've been into aviation for so many years, and I used to pat myself on the back a lot, thinking that, yeah, I, I know a lot of stuff. Here again is Ken Painter. You know, I, I know, you know, all the big names, Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart and the big ones. I didn't know anything about the Stinson girls. It was a complete surprise to me. The airfield where the Stinson family once trained pilots is now called Stinson Municipal Airport. Before Tim O'Crongley started working at his current job, he served as the airport's manager. I asked him what he knew about Catherine Stinson before he started working at the airport that bears her name. You know, nothing much. I actually soloed at Stinson when I was in high school. 
and I, I had known it was you know named after some early aviators, but really didn't have much um, knowledge. One of the first things Tim did as the airport's manager was to acquire a historic marker for the airport. That's when he started learning about, and becoming fascinated with, the barnstormer known as the Flying Schoolgirl. And once I actually learned the story of Catherine and her siblings and the, and the family, I was just fascinated by someone that, that was that kind of entrepreneurial, had that drive and the spirit, and uh, really didn't care what people thought about him. As I learned more about Catherine Stinson, I kept wondering why she remains relatively unknown. Everybody knows about Amelia Earhart, but few have ever heard of Catherine Stinson. Any early female pilot has this, this issue where they kind of live in Amelia's shadow. Matt Anderson is the curator of transportation at the Henry Ford, a history museum in Dearborn, Michigan. See, Amelia Earhart is probably still today the most famous female pilot certainly in the United States, maybe even in the world, which uh, I think does a disservice not only to so many of the women who have flown since her, but a lot of these pioneering women who flew before her. Only about 10 years separate the flying careers of Catherine and Amelia, but a lot changed in that amount of time. Radio and film became much more commonplace, and so by the time Amelia Earhart flew across the Atlantic in 1928, it was possible for her story to reach a much wider audience and for her to achieve a much higher level of fame. She built a brand around herself, and she did that not out of vanity or, or seeking fortune, but instead just to pay for her flights. You know, it was difficult to get the sponsorship to make a, an around-the-world flight, for example. Of course, the other reason we remember Amelia Earhart is that she died, or at least we think she did. You know, frankly, the, uh, the circumstances of her disappearance, I think, have kept her legend alive as well. There, there's always this sense of curiosity about what really happened to her. Did she, she crash in the sea? Did she land on some island and, and, and live for a while? You know, we'll, we'll never probably know the answers to that. But that mystique, I think, surrounding her disappearance is a part of what keeps her name alive as well. Catherine Stinson survived her years of barnstorming as the flying schoolgirl. She survived World War I, the 1918 influenza pandemic, and tuberculosis. And just as she had seamlessly moved from playing the piano to flying an airplane, after she settled in Santa Fe, she became an architect. There she's known as a talented designer who helped popularize the Pueblo revival style that characterizes the city today. By all accounts, Catherine Stinson was the type of person who would have succeeded in doing pretty much anything she set her mind to. She could have been a great concert pianist, but fate took her in a different direction. It took her into the sky, and for a while, it took her to San Antonio. Now, I don't know if playing the piano and flying a plane have all that much in common, but one thing's for sure, flying a plane requires guts, and that's something the flying schoolgirl certainly had. Despite her petite stature and this nickname, she was tough as nails, not only in the kind of stunts she was doing, and she was doing these elaborate loop-de-loops and barrel rolls where she'd be going upside down eight or nine times, but just in her dogged determination to get flying lessons in the first place and then go up and try and do this on her own after that. So that takes guts. There's no question about that. today to Major Jamie Dobson, Ken Painter, Matt Anderson, and Tim O'Crongley. Tim is working on a book about the Stinson family, and you can see some of the photos and other artifacts he's collected by visiting Stinson Municipal Airport. The music was by Blue Dot Sessions. This episode concludes the first season of the San Antonio Storybook. I appreciate you tuning in this season. I've certainly enjoyed sharing these stories with you and hope you have too. Hopefully we'll have more stories to share in seasons to come. In the meantime, though, San Antonio Storybook is a production of the Rivard Report. You can find more information about this podcast and enjoy all the nonprofit journalism the report has to offer at therevardreport.com. And so, until next time, I'm Brantley Hightower. (laughs) 